Dr. Ives, how are you? Thank you so much. It's an honor to have you all of you um, as a panel and a panelist um, in our webinar. So uh, welcome and thank you very much. Without further delay, I shall end up with the Okay, if, if we're ready, we can we can kick off now. So, the chat. Yes, with you, with you. If you can just remember the chat. Sure thing, I will. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. So we'll start the broadcast now. Thank you, Allah. Yeah, they come in after. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome everyone to SASM EMS section webinar through SASM. Uh, this is a great opportunity for us uh, to be in one, one panel. I have my friends and colleagues, mentors here with me joining um, these, these uh, hot topic about COVID-19 pandemic and EMS uh, heroes in dealing with, with, this, uh, with this pandemic. Uh, my name is Dr. Abdelaziz Rubia. I'm an assistant professor of emergency medicine um, at King Saud University. I'm a head uh, unit of EMS, um, EMS at KSUMC, and I'm a head of EMS section at SASM. Uh, today, will, me will be Dr. Eves, Dr. Ahmad, Dr. Ptihal, and Dr. Hani, and we will go in a groups in a discussion of question and answer and share our experience and knowledge in dealing with uh, COVID-19 pandemic from EMS point of view. So to start the um, uh, discussion, uh, it's given me a great pleasure to introduce Professor Eves Hublu. He is the chair of Department of Emergency Medicine at UZ Procell University. He's a chair of the research group on emergency and disaster medicine at the medical school at Virgin University, Brussels. He is a faculty member and chair of strategic management board of the EMDM. Uh, without any further delay, welcome Dr. Eves Hoblo. We, and I forgot to mention Dr. Eves Hoblo also, he is an EMT, practicing certified EMT at Belgium. Um, he spent a lot of time uh, planning, uh, preparing with different disaster. He has a lot of dis uh, disaster experience, uh, happened in Belgium and in Europe. Um, and without any further delay, we'll go with Dr. Heaves. Uh, Dr. Heaves, so welcome. And here's your first question. Um, can you tell us about the EMS system in Belgium? Uh, give us an overview about, about EMS system in Belgium. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Aziz. And uh, thank you for the society to have me invited and to be part of this uh, uh, panel discussion and, and to give uh, or to share the experience we have in uh, in Europe and especially um, in uh, in Belgium um, which I uh, in this first question I, I want to to point out that there are some differences with uh, the EMS systems of the Anglo what we call Anglo-Saxon or you Anglo UK system so first of all uh, the system in Belgium which is a bit comparable to the France system and to the German system is that we have first a 112 uh, dispatch center uh, regulated and controlled by the Ministry uh, of Health where uh, all EMS activities are uh, regulated from. So uh, from sending out the teams uh, and also, and you will see it further on, uh, uh, transferring them to the, to the hospital, which is a bit comparable to the what they call the SAMU in France, uh, the, uh, the, the first responders and the uh, medical assistants in France. Uh, in contrast to the Anglo-Saxon countries, we have no paramedics in Belgium. So that's a big difference. And so we work with what we call the three-tiered system, which with basic EMTs. And when I was a medical student uh, some years ago, I started being an EMT. And this was my first steps into emergency medicine. 
And I continued to do that until uh, I was a doctor and started my residency. And so we have no paramedics. We have EMTs, which are actually firemen. Uh, they, so they, they fight fires, but also they have a, a role in, in staffing the ambulance. They got a basic training of about 140 hours uh, theory and then 20 hours clinic. So they are very basically trained. The, the second tier is what we call our paramedic intervention team, but actually this is an hospital-based ambulance staffed by two EMTs and an emergency care nurse that goes out uh, in special circumstances, regulated by the dispatch center. And then we have the third tier on top of that, which is, and you see at the right uh, side of the screen, a picture I took yesterday, from the rapid response cars, uh, where you have a doctor, an emergency physician, and a nurse going out on the street. So this is a bit the system in generally how it works. Uh, uh, everything is controlled by the 112 dispatch center, and the EMTs are based in the fire brigade stations. And then the second and the third tier, which is the uh, the uh, um, the uh, ambulance staffed with a nurse, an emergency care nurse, and then the, th the third tier with the rapid response car. These are hospital based. This is basically the system uh, in uh, in Belgium, and so, this is comparable to France. So you have you have so two two base for the EMS is is one at the at the fire brigade and yes. the other one in the hospital base. The hospital base is divided into two, uh, yeah. two teams, which is the hospital paramedics, which is yeah. that uh, two EMT plus nurse, and yeah. these, these, that this team will be on the ambulance car, ambulance yeah. track, right? That's, that's and then correct. the other team, the other team, which is which is the uh, the rapid response team, which is like yeah. in the picture, it's yeah. in a small car that yeah. goes that goes first and faster to the to the patients. Yes, that's that's. Completely Excellent. correct. So the EMS system in Belgium, two thirds of the EMS system is part of the hospital. Two thirds. Two thirds. So two tiers: yes. the, the second and the third tier, and then the yeah. basic ambulance is outside of the hospital. So what about the EM, EMT in the fire brigade? Do they have an ambulance, or they joined in the in the in the in the fire brigade's car? Yeah. They have the fire brigade's car, which especially are uh, constructed to, to battle the fires. And then they have yep. ambulances. Like you see in the back of the right picture, you see in the back of the right picture, yep. car, you see in the ambulance hall of the emergency department, you see an ambulance there. And so they have ambulance, yep. but they are very basically yep. equipped with just a semi-automatic defibrillator, oxygen, etc. So they have no medication, okay. they have no advanced airway materials at all. That's coming with the staffed yeah. cars from the hospitals, whether it is a paramedic, so the emergency care, uh, the emergency nurse staffed car or the rapid response car. Okay, so just last last part in this question is, if there is a car accident, for example, who will respond first? Is it is it the EMT from the fire brigade area or one of the hospital based yeah. team? Yeah, it's, it's it will be both because this will yeah. be by the dispatch center. So the dispatch center, we have what we called also a medical regulation. So they have a kind of checklist where they see what is happening in the call and then um, uh, taking into account all the characteristics of the call. Right? For example, if there is a trapped victim, they will send out the ambulance first, will be, will be arriving first on the scene and can do like ABC, the basic things, but they will send out Anyway, whether a ambulance, a nurse staffed ambulance or a rapid response car, depending on the distance uh, between the okay. Yeah. Excellent. Now, so that will move us to the, the second question is the number of the COVID patient positive your institute has transferred during this, this, is COVID, during this COVID-19 pandemic. So can, do you have any rough number about, yeah. about uh, these cases? Yeah, so I will give you the numbers of my hospital and I just checked it yep. today. So it's similar to other hospitals. Okay, the numbers are different, but the, the distributions or the, the characteristics of the patients are similar in, in all of the countries. So uh, normally our, uh -huh. we are uh, um, one of the level one uh, 
uh, university teaching hospital. So we have a mean of about, in normal circumstances, 270 patients uh, a day, uh, between 270 and 300 a day. So about 80 to 85,000 a year. Um, we have okay. about uh, 20 to 25 EMS interventions per day, so one per hour. And when we had the lockdown uh, that was installed in Belgium uh, around 17 of March, we saw a drop in the patients. We saw they dropped in a total to 100 uh, per day, to 150 maximum. And uh, when we divided the department at that time into the COVID and non-COVID area, we saw that in the beginning we had 80% of COVID suspected patients versus 20% of non covid suspected patients but very so out of very, out of 100 out of 100 yes so. uh, that went up uh, as is to sometimes we had the peak uh, early ap april so then it went up to about uh, 50 to 100 patients with uh, 80 patients in uh, maximum of of covid related so we were never overwhelmed Why? because the, the, there are a lot of uh, hospitals in, in, like in the Brussels area. Uh, you have a, a hospital every, every corner of the street. So all those hospitals were involved in the response and we were yeah. never overcrowded with a lot of patients. So it was very manageable. Uh, yeah. these are, uh, and this, is, this was actually similar to the, the other hospitals. Nowadays, today, we have the opposite. We have 20% and even less 10% of COVID uh, suspected cases versus 80 to 90% of non-COVID. A very strange thing what we saw in the beginning of the pandemic, which is end of March, early of April, we didn't see acute myocardial infarction. We didn't see strokes. We didn't see any normal non-COVID related activity because as I heard this is an international phenomenon I don't know why yeah. uh, it seems that COVID is is protective against those things I, I yeah. maybe too short notice but this is what we saw and uh, uh, yeah. regarding oh. and that's the final thing regarding how many patients went to the ICU if you got four non-critical patients we got one so it's a, a relationship one on four that went to ICU all right. Okay. So that's really good. Almost the same here also. The non-COVID cases has dropped down dramatically compared to just highly suspecting COVID. Yeah. So uh, I think it's a global global issues. Yeah. Uh, moving moving to, to um, question number three. Um, in the hospital area, uh, we did lots of changing plans. Uh, we changed lots of guidelines and uh, we will talk about that with Dr. Tihal and Dr. Ahmed, inshallah. So uh, lots of guidelines have been changed. In your institution, uh, what about the transferring or transporting guidelines? Have you changed any? And can you tell us about this? Yeah, if you mean by transferring, so getting the admission of COVID-19 positive through the EMS system towards our hospital. Yes. 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 We have yeah, as I said in the beginning, we have a, a medical regulated dispatch center. So there are guidelines with checklists, etc. And there was uh, an intervention by the ministry and, uh, and task forces. Uh, they they uh, installed a, a specific COVID-19 suspicion, uh, um, like I said, uh, checklist. So if patients with very simple questions or either by the telephone or by the ambulance that came on the scene, that the patient could be a, a, a possible COVID-19 uh, suspected case by asking, okay, does he have fever? Does he have shortness of breath? Does she has uh, other symptoms, probably uh, dangerous for COVID? They were derived towards uh, uh, the departments uh, with an, an alert system by the dispatch center to the hospital that, okay, there is an ambulance coming uh, with a suspected case. The ambulance also sending out from the fire brigade stations. They were especially equipped with PPE for the, for the EMTs, etc. So there was actually from the, the call uh, and the arrival on the scene, a, a very, uh, very basic, and it's coming also in one of, I think your latest question, are there, uh, yes. how they manage it? So it's a bit, it's a bit overlapping. So these were the, the specific guidelines that were active. 
So we, would, we knew that there was a positive or a possible positive or suspected case that was arriving. So we could prepare. So there, there, will be, yeah. there will be, which will coming in the next, uh, after, I think after another question is yeah. there is like a phone screening system that you guys implemented on to know uh, what is what is the, yeah. uh, what's the highly suspecting COVID cases so you can yeah. prepare and act on it. Excellent. Yeah. What about the inter-hospital transfer, Prof. Eves? Have you changed your guidelines? Sure. Again, again, with the uh, disaster plans uh, activated in the country and the hospital disaster plans activated in the country, there were specific guidelines for inter-hospital transfer. So normally, uh, hospitals are are doing this kind of things uh, in between themselves, and they don't go to the dispatch center. So they they regulate the, the transfer by themselves. So this was now stopped and it was taken over by the dispatch center. So you could not transfer any patients at all without notifying the dispatch center. This was a first step. Okay. Uh, then uh, the dispatch center and they organized themselves with special transfer ambulances. So, so that the other, the first responding ambulance stay there for the EMS system. And those who would do the inter-hospital transfer were on top of that. So the Red Crescent, the Belgian Red Crescent, uh, actively uh, uh, worked on that. The second, some private ambulances did that. And a very big part was done by the military. So the medical uh, component of the Belgian army uh, is very specialized in, in like uh, uh, CBRN activity, etc. And they have special ambulances. And so on all of the countries in the different provinces, there was one or two military ambulances that was taking care about the inter-hospital transfers so that the hospitals Excellent. didn't have to take care about that. Excellent, so we have we have the Red Crescent participation, the private sectors and the military, and the military. they all participated helping the hospital team in, in this era, either yeah. in the in the inter hospital and so, also in the pre hospital okay so that the hospital team as i said in the beginning could focus only on the primary intervention with the nursing ambulance and or the rapid response car we didn't have to take care about the inter hospital transfer yeah excellent now moving on i think we've just highlighted about it there is a if there is a, an emergency out of hospital and you you have been called to respond to that yeah. You guys have a screening tools, right? Yeah. Uh, to screen for COVID-19 case. You don't go yeah. blindly to, no. to that calls without screening. So yeah. if you screened, if you screened and the, and the patient scored a high suspicion, what's, what's your guidelines here? So the guidelines were very simple. Uh, in other, yeah. in circumstances, normal circumstances, they would send the basic ambulance just transferring the, the patient. So here, as there was, and we can we will come back on that later in the last question a, a special fear by our first responders of getting how how to treat such kind of patients they uh, as we have the nursing staffed ambulance as we have the rapid response car in this kind of scenario and now with the pandemic we send out very quickly those two other kinds of uh, methods on the scene so we saw our interventions from the hospitals going on the scene to patients with COVID suspected uh, symptoms, they were uh, easily uh, supported by that nursing staffed ambulance and the rapid response car. So that the EMTs were get the support from either a nurse or a nurse and a doctor on the scene. And they didn't have to take uh, much risk of et cetera, et cetera. So we saw, we doubled, we saw the doubling of our intervention in 24 hours where we have no, normally 20, to 20, no, 10 to 15 uh, interventions, EMS interventions in normal circumstances, we saw that going up to 25 to 30 a day, okay. just um, uh, in that in those situations. This Excellent. is again now dropping down. We see again that normal ambulances with the EMTs are getting the patients back to the hospital uh, as, as before the lockdown and before the pandemic started. So possibly people getting adapted and they're going back slowly back to yes. the normal to normal. Now the, the the challenges nowadays or uh, it was very challenging uh, in the beginning of the pandemic. Now it's possibly people st so they knew what they are doing. Is the PPA challenges now? 
Did you face a big problems with the PPA? This is until today my my worst nightmare. Uh, right. And uh, for three for three aspects. First, uh, getting enough PPE available for the staff and especially also for the pre-hospital. My second nightmare was obtain the right PPE, so FFP2, FFP3, because there was in the beginning it was okay, but then I think internationally there was a, sh a shortage of PPE material everywhere. Everybody was buying it all over the world, over the globe. It was a global issue. And my third thing, and this we, we had the time, you know what our Italian colleagues, they and as Spanish colleagues, they suffered a lot, but as we had the luck that we saw that happening and we had the time to prepare ourselves. And what we did in that time to prepare is train and train and train and train our people to put on the PPE, to take off the PPE, and just to work with the PPE because uh, we uh, used uh, special complete uh, suits to work in the COVID area and our you saw it on the picture for the EMS system. They went also out in a complete suit, but this is a, not a normal habitat how to perform uh, pre-hospital care. So we we did a lot of training. So in the in the beginning of the pandemic, end of February, beginning of March, when there were no not a lot of victims coming to the emergency department, we 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 spend the spare time with the personnel in getting. Uh, the training done. And these were my three challenges, getting the, the right numbers, uh, getting the right uh, quality of PPE, and then training of the people. And today, my most, most concern is one and two. The training is okay. They are used to do it. But do I have enough PPE to, for tomorrow, for next week, etc.? Because we don't know how it will evolve. We went over the peak. We are now really in the descent. But Will there, there will be a second wave? When it will be, and how hard it will get? So this is a big question. I think everywhere. Yes, I think I believe so. Still, it's still it's a question. It's still, everyone is anxious about the PPE. Uh, we we change lots of things. We put lots of guidelines, specific guidelines, especially for N95, when to wear it, when not to wear it, uh, yeah. and when to use it. So I think similar, it's a global similar. issues. Similar. Similar there. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Now, so now uh, the important question now comes to you is after yeah. transferring the patients, now what do you do with the ambulance car? Yeah. And That's so you, you put one case which came up positive patient yeah. or a highly suspecting positive patient. So what do you do? How do you disinfect this car? There again, we had a, a very good collaboration with the fire brigade who actually uh, is, is, uh, is managing all the the car park, all the ambulance park, uh, each, which is available in, in the EMS, and also with the military. So if the ambulance um, uh, that is part from the 112 system uh, that goes out and there is a positive case, it goes back to the central uh, central station and there is a procedure that the ambulance is, is completely disinfected. We take care about the materials that are being used inside of the uh, the ambulance, mm -hmm. the same with our own cars, because the rapid response car is, is our own, but we don't transport patients with that. We only transport the material. So all the medical materials are taken care of by ourselves. And the second uh, uh, part of uh, when we do the inter-hospital transfers, this is done by a military ambulance and they are specialized in disinfecting their ambulance. So this was no major issue. This is very, from the beginning, very well done. So it's well done and well planned from your side. No, no, no bottleneck on that. All right. Okay, good. Now, now let's come to the last part um, for your discussion, Dr. Eves, is the psychological impact of COVID-19 on EMS personnel. Um, what, did, what did this COVID pandemic do to your EMS? Have, have they become less active? Uh, have they, are, are they fair of, of coming to the work? Um, uh, they, are they anxious? Um, did they change their lifestyle, especially with the yeah. families? Um, yeah. Have anyone been diagnosed with a depression or anxiety during this pandemic? So can you just highlight about this? Yeah. And or do you have any, any support system for your personnel from the psychological point of view? Yeah, to get uh, answering on your first uh, questions, we, we did some research on that in the past also, before even the pandemic. Uh, um, research on 
what what is the most challenging or the most uh, where is actually do do people that interfere in a dangerous situation, whether it be like a COVID-19 or a another CBRN or you know, we had in 2016, we had a lot of terror activity in Europe uh, with shootings and bombings, etc. And so we asked our personnel at that time and also this time, what is uh, causing you the most uh, problems in, in, in getting that intervention? So, and it was anxious. They were anxious getting infected, but not for themselves, but taking the infection at home to their family. So that's the reason why, and I'm coming back on the PPE. My most, my, my, my most important concern from the beginning of the pandemic until today is getting my personnel, EMS, they go out on the street or even in the hospital, the right PPE and that they, they don't uh, have a high risk of getting infected and taking that at home. So we provided even uh, laundry services uh, at the hospital so that they could take their clothes off, their PPE, and then the clothes that they were believed that they stay in the hospital they, they, and they go out with their own clothes that they don't infect their family at home. That's the first thing. The, the, okay. the second thing, we provided psychological care. So there is a psychological care organized by the ministry. Fire brigade and police, they have their what we call psychological first aid response teams, we could take, uh, we could go for, to them also. So it was enlarged to also EMS personnel. And then especially our hospital provided since the beginning, all the clinical psychologists that were available uh, to speak to them, uh, etc. I personally in the 150 uh, uh, equivalents of personnel I have in my department, so nurses, doctors, and administrative personnel, they went to the psychologist, but I didn't have any major uh, problem uh, at all. And on all the period now in 10 to 11 weeks that we are active in the pandemic, we had five, five positive COVID patients within the personnel. So I congratulate them because they did a great job. Only five in 10 weeks, that means that, or we had a chance, or they put their PPE yeah. very, very, very yeah. well. And so I was very happy. So that psychological support is going on. And there is now more and more from the ministry, a central thing that for to see how, how it will be on the long term. So uh, this was a, in, a, in a nutshell, the, the psychological impacts, which is you can have a, a webinar on that by yourself, I think. Of, of course, it is, it's just a webinar. And we did, I think, the first webinar sure, uh, sure. was 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 about, about psychological support. Yeah. Excellent. So th thanks, Dr. Eves, for for uh, ah, for ah, uh, giving ah, us, ah, <laughs> sharing <laughs> us and giving us your valuable information. Yeah. Uh, moving on to our second um, guest speaker, Dr. Ahmed Al Khraisi. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to meet him through this webinar. Um, Dr. Ahmed Al Khraisi is a general director of Riyadh region at uh, Saudi Red Crescent Authority. Uh, he is a Saudi board certified in preventive medicine. He has a diploma in mass gathering and disaster medicine and master in healthcare management. Mashallah tabarakallah. It's really, it's really a good chance to have such a nice uh, a leader uh, of our colleague in, in um, Saudi Red Crescent Authority. It's our pleasure to have you, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you, Dr. Abdelaziz. It's my pleasure to share this webinar with uh, uh, one of uh, known expert in EMS. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, uh, presenting a good information for uh, uh, listening for us. And uh, uh, it's my pleasure to share uh, with this webinar. And I, will, I would uh, to thank Saudi Society of Emergency Medicine uh, to inviting me, uh, and uh, inshallah, we'll present a good uh, talk. Inshallah. Inshallah. So, Dr. Ahmed, can you can you tell us us uh, tell us about guidelines that you implemented in transferring COVID nineteen patients? We heard about the Belgium experience. Now we want to know our experience in Saudi Arabia about transferring COVID nineteen patients especially at a big institution, a leader of EMS system in our country, Saudi Red Crescent Authority. 
uh, actually in uh, Saudi Arabia, um, mainly the Saudi Arabia president is the mayor responsible for uh, responding uh, to the in his call uh, in the for the community and uh, working as a third party uh, situation uh, and. Uh, uh, it's focus on uh, the community uh, responding, uh, while the colleagues in hospital uh, focusing in uh, intra-facility transportation uh, and helping us in uh, uh, disaster and uh, situation like uh, our uh, our situation now uh, pandemic of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, actually, uh, when we receive a call. Uh, through a dispatch room. Uh, there is a categorization for the call. Is it emergency, non-emergency, uh, categorizing according to the uh, chief complaint. Uh, during this uh, uh, pandemic, uh, we stress on uh, for, phone triage or phone screening. Uh, so uh, uh, we modify our uh, uh, phone screening uh, to do, uh, doing the best for the best number uh, during the states. Actually, we uh, we receive a lot of call, so uh, we stress on uh, phone triage, uh, and also uh, we stress on scene triage. Actually, our uh, uh, system uh, uh, is like play and go, uh, so, uh, sorry, uh, load and go, and not say yep. play. So uh, now we uh, stress on uh, scene triage also, uh, specifically for ALS team, uh, this is the second uh, uh, change. I see uh, procedure done during this uh, pandemic, and also uh, we stress on precaution uh, when dealing with uh, suspected patient. Uh, so now nowadays uh, uh, during this pandemic, every patient. We uh, looking for uh, for uh, for them as uh, a suspected case for uh, COVID nineteen. So uh, we uh, take a, uh, we uh, we stress on taking a precaution for droplet or droplet precaution uh, and asking uh, if possible to uh, put a surgical mask on uh, the patient. Uh, uh, if uh, if we um, so, uh, expecting to do uh, erosal generating procedure, uh, increasing the uh, precaution to uh, airborne precaution. That's uh, in general our guideline uh, during transition. So, so it's it's been modified to to load and go scene triage by ELS system, and uh, everyone is covered till proven otherwise. And you set a guideline for erosal generating procedures. Excellent. Okay. Moving on to, to again the same question that I asked Prof. Eves. I will ask you, Dr. Ahmed, PPE challenges. Did you face a problem with the PPE? And how did you act on that? Uh, actually, I, uh, I agree with Dr. Eves. Uh, uh, this is the uh, uh, regarding the PPE shortage, it's uh, uh, not. Uh, uh, one country challenge. This is a, a global challenge for BBE shortage in the market. Uh, so uh, uh, we face the same problem. Uh, actually, we are looking for uh, the alternatives uh, for for dealing with the, this shortage, like we extending the usage of uh, goggles. Um, okay. uh, can be used uh, or reused uh, after doing a disinfection, uh, disinfecting uh, by self spray uh, between patient and patient. Uh -huh. uh, in 95, it's used just for airborne uh, or uh, erosive generating procedures. This uh, this is one one uh, challenge. Another challenge: training uh, of our staff. Uh, we stress on training and what's our protocol in dealing with uh, uh, with COVID-19 patients. Uh, uh, we extend our uh, training through 
using online uh, training, uh, mini webinars done uh, also for uh, not our staff, also for uh, our community. Uh, this is the second challenge. Actually, we face a fair challenge in different, uh, uh, which is uh, we need to uh, fix it uh, as soon as possible. Uh, uh, different, uh, different, uh, different protocol used in our country, unfortunately, by AMS agencies. Uh, but uh, uh, in Saudi Arabia, for instance, we, we stress on following Wakaya uh, or Saudi CDC protocol. Well, and uh, that, that's, uh, that's uh, our challenge. Yeah. Excellent. So the PPE challenge is there. You faced it. So you did some modification, which is goggles, extending the, the use of goggles by cleaning it. N95, which is probably, we, we, I believe, all the hospitals in Saudi Arabia and maybe in, in uh, across Europe is N95 is specified to uh, erosal generating procedure. Otherwise, surgical mask all time will be will be sufficient so far. That's the best evidence. And the training for PPE use, I think it's really mandatory that initially we pushed our our team to go through the PPE training uh, either by online courses or if it's quite as possible, like a short group, less than five people. And I agree, you, uh, uniforming the, the protocols and we all either, I believe pre-hospital or even hospital, we follow Wiqaya, the Saudi CDC web, website. This is our guidelines. We don't make any guidelines. It's made by only the MOH. Excellent. Now, moving on to... to uh, yes. Yeah, uh, the last point, uh, for, uh, actually, this is a, a pause for uh, different uh, guidelines. Uh, you know, uh, there was a debate between uh, uh, is the COVID-19 uh, uh, droplet, uh, droplet uh, transmission or airborne transmission. This is uh, yani, uh, one of the uh, uh, challenges we faced. Uh, but uh, yes. we standing on national reference. Uh, uh, we will uh, be safe, inshallah. Inshallah. Now, I think we just touched this uh, question again, is the phone screening. Uh, tools that you have in in uh, in, in your authority, um, is it is it different from the wakaya, the, the one that we use in our hospitals, or it's the same, the screening tools? Uh, yeah, the screening tools actually uh, we follow also wakaya uh, uh, scale for uh, assessing the uh, suspicion score uh, for the uh, receiving call. Uh, but also we uh, add some uh, modification to uh, categorize is it emergency call or not so we uh, we focus on level of consciousness uh, and uh, uh, is there a, a short breath or chest pain and we focus on the age is uh, is the a patient uh, elder or uh, yeah, uh, child child uh, uh, all these questions is important for us to uh, categorize the uh, needing for uh, ambulance. Uh, we know uh, the situation in, uh, let's say, in my uh, country, uh, uh, we have we have some big crisis actually. Uh, so we 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 appreciate uh, the efforts done by our colleagues in the ER. Uh, departments and uh, hospital and trying to uh, sending uh, the needed uh, patients uh, or the uh, emergent patients uh, as we can. Excellent. So that will push us to, to uh, a fourth question, which is the guidelines for transferring the COVID-19 patient by the Saudi Red Crescent. So have you, uh, initially you said there is different guidelines then we uniformed it. Can you just highlight about the guidelines that you followed? Just, just the key points. Yeah. Again, we follow the guideline uh, uh, the, uh, presented uh, by uh, Saudi CDC, uh, which is uh, updated many times, but uh, we are following the, this guideline. Uh, after we, uh, uh, the mission ended 
by uh, uh, received uh, or uh, the patient received by a hospital uh, if, if, uh, if the patient need to send the hospital uh, we uh, following the uh, status of the patient is uh, is oh, is okay. uh, the patient suspected for covid-19 really uh, is uh, and also we uh, following the uh, saudi uh, or uh, health uh, health sy surveillance system hassan uh, and checking the status of this patient uh, is uh, the uh, the patient uh, uh, turn uh, his status turned to uh, confirmed case or not uh, so we uh, also uh, uh, following our staff uh, checking uh, is the uh, uh, if they uh, wearing uh, full uh, PPE as uh, as instructed by our protocol which is based on uh, Saudi CDC uh, and uh, regarding the ambulance uh, we advise the EMS team according to the level of uh, suspicion and uh, contacting with the receiving hospital uh, to doing uh, disinfection for uh, for the ambulance according to the level of uh, suspicion, either a complete, uh, terminal cleaning or uh, intensive uh, disinfection or uh, just uh, using a surface spray and uh, uh, making sure every surface used by the patient is uh, disinfected. Cleaned, excellent. So it's immediately after each case, right? You do the disinfection and you, 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 you clean the, the track. Excellent, yeah. good. Uh, so we've kind of highlighted to this question about the cleaning. So we'll move for the last question. And I think this is, this is very important question is is the challenges that are facing the Saudi Red Crescent authorities. So if you can summarize this one, Dr. Ahmed, for us during this pandemic. Yeah, uh, dur actually during this pandemic, and uh, we we know uh, in any crisis or any uh, uh, disaster situation, if we can uh, see, uh, a non-emergency call is more than emergency call. Uh, uh -huh. And actually we face this problem. Uh, non-emergency call um, uh, since the COVID-19 has been reported in our country until now. Uh, we received a lot of non-emergency call uh, in Riyadh region uh, uh, from uh, uh, the first case reported in our country until now. We received around uh, 300,000 uh, call in our dispatch room. Uh, uh, just 14% uh, of uh, these calls is emergency call, and the remaining is oh. not. <laughs> uh, that's, re that's really a big load, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and this stress on our uh, dispatch room, really. Uh, and uh, we hope uh, increasing the awareness. Uh, and we, we did some, uh, some activity in our uh, institution and uh, to to increase the awareness uh, of when to use the uh, Saudi Red Crescent emergency call 997 or uh, using the uh, application as uh, 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 Actually, we uh, we're facing uh, some improvement, but still we received an emergency call. But uh, now we have a better uh, usage of this uh, of this uh, number and uh, this is the first uh, challenge actually the second challenge increasing emis mission and, uh, with movement restriction uh, measures actually uh, many of uh, of patients calling us uh, why they they cannot uh, go by himself to the uh, nearest, uh, let's say, uh, not even the uh, uh, emer uh, emergency hosp or hospital, Ju just they want to go to clinic or some, uh, uh, ju just to use uh, 
uh, they want the care facility. Yeah, yeah, healthcare facility. Okay. Uh, yeah. But still, we, uh, the incre uh, there is increasing in uh, the mission. Uh, and we we making some uh, deployment for our resources in, uh, and uh, also uh, using volunteers to help us uh, in uh, in, the, in facing uh, the increasing of MS mission. The third uh, challenge uh, we appreciate our colleagues in emergency department uh, and we know they are uh, uh, under stress. And uh, also we uh, do some stress on them uh, by uh, uh, transferring some patient uh, to uh, uh, busy ER. Uh, but uh, uh, I know uh, they are appreciating our effort. Uh, actually, uh, if we going back to the numbers uh, from three, 300, uh, thousand calls for 10 percent only uh, we uh, send uh, send the AMS team for them and only 40 percent of uh, of uh, this uh, uh, mission uh, need a transfer for the hospital so uh, actually uh, we're hoping to increase uh, the collaboration with us to uh, facilitate the receiving of our patients uh, uh, if 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 I have time, I actually I uh, we have a fourth challenge, which is the important to us uh, psychological yes. uh, stress on our team. Uh, you know, uh, when uh, when the uh, when the COVID nineteen started, uh, uh, there was uncertainty about the, this disease. Uh, more, uh, most of them uh, uh, um, afraid from uh, taking the patient. Actually, we stress on uh, uh, the education, and uh, we have a, a unit to give the psychological support for them. Uh, and we appreciate their 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 offer, efforts. Uh, and I know uh, our community also appreciate their. Efforts. Excellent, excellent. So, so in summary, it uh, you received like three hundred thousand of call, fourteen of them, fourteen percent with uh, an acute emergency, of which forty percent you transfer to the hospital, and um, uh, and um, uh, you try to educate uh, the people, and um, by uh, doing advertising uh, as uh application, which is really a good application, and it saved lots of time. Uh, then uh, you try to increase the EMS mission by using the volunteer people. Um, more collaboration with the emergency department. This is, this is really a big challenge for you guys. I believe uh, we need more collaboration between the emergency department and the Saudi Red Crescent um, Authority. Uh, and I know the pain, Ahmed, I will not talk about that at the moment. Uh, then um, uh, psychological support, which is really, really a good one. And I believe we need it um, as much as possible. Uh, so by this, we conclude with Dr. Ahmed al Khraisi. Uh, thank you so much. I will, I will give you time, inshallah, Ahmed, Eves, and all the other speakers later on to if you have any points to add. And I'm, I'm receiving a few questions, so maybe we can answer it together. And now that uh, will give me a great pleasure uh, to introduce our third speaker, um, uh, Dr. Abtihal Muhammad Al-Abbas. She is a Deputy Supervisor of Emergency Medical Services Unit at King Abdulaziz University Hospital in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. So all the way from Jeddah, Dr. Abtihal is joining us uh, in, in our webinar. So welcome, Dr. Abtihal. Thank you, Dr. Abdulaziz. Hey, uh, assalamu alaikum. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you all for giving me the opportunity to be here today uh, with you. And I would like to take the opportunity to say thank you, a huge thank you for all the AMS provider out there uh, that they're working day and night taking care of our patient uh, in the front line during this time. So really, jazamullah khair. Jazamullah khair. Thank you for them again. Thank you for this, uh, uh, for this, uh, for this like recognition of their effort. 
Now, Dr. Tihal, you're from a university hospital. So we heard from the European experience, especially Belgium. We heard our colleague uh, from uh, Saudi Red Crescent Authority. Now, let's go into the university side, the, the Ministry of Education, uh, which is um, what, what changes that you did at your unit for the EMS services during this COVID-19 COVID pandemic? Okay, uh, so we actually, you know, that like usually the university uh, units cover only the university campus. Uh, no. So um, the change, we, we made many changes related to that. So in the scene response itself uh, and in the transport. Uh, so in the scene response, they have, obviously we don't have like the uh, luxury to have the dispatch and the calling center. We actually receive the call and we have to respond and we don't know what's going on. Like, we don't know what is the call. So we just received the call from our uh, disaster uh, center and we have just to respond. So uh, our staff trained to, in the scene itself, they have to identify from far away when they arrive to the scene, if there is any respiratory symptom, uh, the patient have it. Uh, and if yes, uh, they have to uh, start the isolation process, which is they can assist the patient at least two meter away. They have to give the patient face mask before they contact him. They have to put their uh, full PPE, which is the minimum uh, face, sh uh, face shield with the regular mask and uh, the gown with double gloves. Uh, and they have to take the least equipment to the uh, scene. So they only taking like within the pulse oximeter and a very minimal stuff really that they're going to need. And they have to inform the receiving hospital if they are suspecting a COVID patient. During the transport, actually, the changes we made. So the staff learn how to control their environment in the ambulance and how to follow the procedure. So for controlling the environment, for us, we are lucky our ambulance has a separate driver compartment from patient compartment. So what we usually do, we try to isolate both compartment. We have a door, so we shut the door down and we tape it with like a plastic tape or something to make the two compartments completely separate. Uh, they uh, advise to keep the air conditioning on high and non recirculating on both uh, sides. And they have to put the exhaust fan on high uh, on the patient compartment. Uh, they need, they also instructed to keep the driver uh, compartment sterile, which means that if the patient was critical and two, uh, two uh, EMS provider have to deal with the patient, not only one, uh, the driver has to take off his PPE and keep only the mask while he's driving the ambulance back to the hospital. Uh, and during the transfer, uh, they have not, like, they shouldn't take any family with them. And if they must take a family, the family member has to have gloves on and a mask. Uh, they have to try limit the exposure time. So what mean, what we meant with that, I told them if you guys saw that the patient is stable, you don't have to be in the patient compartment. So both uh, EMS provider can drive in the front and leave the patient in the back. If the patient needed an oxygen through nasal cannula or uh, mask, they can put the nasal cannula, but they have to put a mask on the top of it to cover the patient's face to decrease the droplet. They don't use any stethoscope anymore. Uh, there is, uh, they are prohibited now to do intubation, no nebulizer in the ambulance. Uh, they can use only the MDI, as you can see, we, we, if you can show us the picture. Uh, they know that they cannot use suction, no OPA, nothing. Uh, so uh, the way that you can use the MDI actually, lower the inhaler, uh, because you don't want even the droplet to come out when you instruct the patient. So we take the, you take the face, uh, the uh, non rebreather, you take off the plastic uh, bag, take it out, mm -hmm. put the ECG uh, uh, stickers on the side so you can cover all the opening in the mask and you start using the MDI. Actually, this plastic piece, you can replace it with any plastic piece. You can just tape the inhaler. And by this, they are safe to use the uh, uh, the inhaler in the ambulance uh, without a lot of risk of trans, uh, trans uh, of exposure. So, uh, and after the transport, so what they supposed to do they clean the ambulance, actually, we clean the ambulance by ourselves. So they wipe any uh, soiled, obviously soiled places, any place that the patient might touch uh, during the transfer. 
and they have to keep the doors open to recirculate the air. And we actually have like some of the airborne disinfectant that we used between the transfers. Um, and after that, they have to doff their PPE. Uh, so our staff is trained to take off their PPE and we are trying to like decrease the exposure as much as we can. So what we are doing that in the call, each provider is supervising the other to take off the PPE to make sure there is no breach in taking off the PPE so they don't get exposed. Excellent. And they have their checklist that they have to follow during that. Um, and really, I think like any provider out there, if they just have three assumptions in mind that everything they touch is contaminated and anyone they meet is contagious and they are also might be contagious, they will take more care about PPE. Um, yep, that's all for our response. I agree, I agree. The really, really nice and validated points. So uh, lots of changes that, that you, you, uh, you did starting from uh, uh, like um, it's a university campus only, you're taking all of the university campus, the respiratory symptom, isolation, face mask. Here, here I get a question from the audience. So uh, is, is the equipment required to wear during the transfer, which already you highlighted is, is the PPE and the minimum requirement is four things, as you mentioned, just a surgical face mask, gloves, uh, gowns, uh, which is the yellow gowns in Saudi Arabia, or, or you can find a blue gown probably, and uh, goggles. Yeah, or face shield. So these are the four minimum requirements um, uh, that uh, everyone should wear. Um, I like the idea of less equipment and scene. You want to protect the equipment. You want to minimize the uh, the, the 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 transferring of a, like bugs or anything in the car. And controlling the environment is really lovely tricks that you mentioned, Doctora um, Tihal. Uh, and uh, I love the three assumptions contaminated, contagious, and you are contagious. So it's really, really lovely one. And it should be really, this is, should be a tweet done by SASA, a really one at the COVID-19 era. Okay, moving on to, to, to the second question is um, cardiac arrest, CPR at the pre-hospital care. I think this is a big topic. Let's give it some shots, Dr. Tihal. So uh, we actually already had like, I think one or two cardiac arrests during COVID, which is, to be honest, in our campus, it's very rare. Like you get it usually once or twice a year, but so far we got one or two in a couple of months. Um, so as so far, uh, again, uh, we are following the AHA guidelines, which is, uh, which is, first of all, you assume that anybody unconscious, it's infected with COVID, so you cannot assist the patient unless you have your full PPE. So if we were lucky and when we get the call, we know that it's a person down or unconscious, the staff will move on with their full PPE. I mean with N95. So at this time they will move to N95 and to Tyvek suit. So it will be like a, a, level, a higher level. Um, then after a while, when they arrive to the scene, they cannot get close to the patient to do listen and feel. So no listen and feel anymore. They have to cover the patient face. As you guys can see in the picture, anything around nylon, uh, a towel, a piece of clothes, a surgical mask, anything they have to just cover the patient mouth to start the CPR. Actually, in this picture, there is like a simulation that you can put the nylon, but I think this is like in the hospital. Uh, you cannot yeah. really do it in the pre-hospital. Um, why we are doing that, like, and if you can show me the other picture, there is a study that's done, uh, not published yet. They uh, saw that every time you are doing a chest compression, there is a risk of like a droplet and aerosols coming from the patient mouth. And when you are covered with the surgical mask, it's make the aerosol and the droplet very less. So you are actually decreasing the risk of exposure. So uh, the second thing, they are instructed to put actually an oxygen mask with non rebreather. And again, on the top of it, a, a face, uh, uh, face mask, uh, no using of BVM at all at my institute. But I would recommend if anyone else has to use the PVM, they have two ways to use it. They need to put a viral filter on. And if they're going to do the embo bag, they have to do use the seal with the two hands. You can show us the other pictures. Uh, then at, this is the only way they can use. So they cannot do the CNE. They have to do the VNE, which is with two hands. So they have like good seal. And they have to use the viral filter. If you can show me the second picture. 
So they Sorry, can see it the... attached. Yeah, the one out there. Yeah. So this is yeah, this is the viral filter that you can attach it. So it will minimize the risk for the staff. Uh, and again, no uh, no intubation, no suction. The new thing that uh, if according to the HA, if there is no return of continuous circulation or ROSC after 10 minutes, you need to call for termination uh, of code. Obviously, we can't do this in the university. So I instruct them to bring the patient on because I mean our like response like the time for transfer is very minimal is less than five minutes so it's really not a big deal uh, but i would recommend anyone up there uh if they are not doing it to do it uh because the survival rate is after 10 minutes uh, the chances yeah. is low and the risk is high for infection and exactly. uh, the other recommendation that they cannot uh move the patient transfer the patient uh with continuous cpr in the back of the ambulance if the patient has witnessed a risk they have to pull over, park the ambulance, open the doors, and continue CPR. That's like, it's really, it's important for them. Even if they, like, to be honest, if they transfer the patient without starting CPR, it's not a big deal. It's very close to the hospital. But, I mean, they still can do that. Yeah, um, yeah I, that's I know, I, I know my brother and uh, colleagues in EMS, they're really eager. They can't. They can't wait. They want to act. Yes. I know that. But as Dr. Abtihal said, please be careful. Your safety is first. Your safety means the society safety. So I think with the recommendation that Dr. Abtihal mentioned uh, is really helpful. Um, uh, nowadays, there is a big discussion about, I think in, in North America, they don't do CPR for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. So uh, that's one thing. Uh, second thing um, is course, there is a discussion about doing CPR. Even at the hospital emergency door, there was a discussion about doing the CPR just outside the hospital door in open air. Do not bring the, the patient inside unless there is a pulse. And I completely agree. I think we should stop doing the CPR while patient can move. Um, stop the ambulance track, park it, open the door, or even take the patient out of the track and do CPR if you can maintain the patient confidentiality. Excellent. So um, moving to, to the third question is a procedures. Uh, if, he, if the patient has a pneumothorax and you wanted to insert a chest tube, let's say tension pneumothorax, and you wanted to insert chest tube in the pre-hospital area, what changes that you advise for the therapy health? So um, all the changes that I'm going to talk about, it's really not evidence-based, but it's a, yeah. using common sense and pathophysiology. So if we think about the physiology, patient is who is infected with like the COVID virus, and then they have injury to the lung, any procedure invade the chest wall, uh, it has the possible risk of exposure, either by airborne or, or aerosolized uh, or like droplet. So the needle decompression, if we think of it, you are just putting a needle and it's release air under pressure. So really it's produce a droplet. A recommendation to put a full BPE to do it. Uh, it's better if an experienced provider is out there to do it. And again, you have to weigh the risk and benefit because it's a life-saving procedure. But you need to put your PPE, even if it's life-saving procedure, you have to be safe before the patient. I'm sorry to say that, but this is, I mean, as you said before, we are not used to do this. We usually like run for the patient and do the stuff. But nowadays we really have to balance the, uh, the risk and benefit and think of, are we safe? And then uh, do the, uh, and, and check the patient needs. And for the chest tube, I mean, there is, we don't put chest tube in the pre-hospital, but I would recommend if you are doing it in the hospital, do it in the, um, negative pressure room, clamp the chest tube, use a viral filter, because if there is an air leak in the chest tube, this is a risk of infection again. So, Excellent. So uh, uh, as, as you said, needle decompression, it's an aerolizing generation procedure. Uh, that's, let's, let's keep it like that. We have to be very careful in putting it. That hiss and the pressure of air coming out is really dangerous. So we have to, we have to be careful about that. Um, you, you put this picture of the doctor yes. so, um, can you just... Uh... Uh, so this is only like to show how you can connect the, when you are connecting the suction canister to the chest tube, you need to put a viral filter in between the suction and the, uh, the device itself. So it will prevent the virus coming out to the air, which will decrease the risk of exposure. 
uh, I mean, they're still doing some studies on it. There is nothing published yet, but it's one of the things that hopefully it's decreased the exposure. Excellent. Thank you so much. Now, psychological impact. So what did you do at your shop, uh, Dr. Abtihal, to support your EMS system at the university oh, uh, yeah. from the psychological point of view? So, uh, well, I mean, uh, for my staff, I mean, we are a small unit, so I'm always with them. Uh, I hope I'm doing my job right. Uh, uh, any transport, like they are worried about if we know that there is inter, because we have also inter-facility transport. So if we know for sure that we are transferring a COVID patient from the hospital out to the, like the MOH places for the quarantine, uh, I usually uh, be with them, make sure that they put their PPE right. Uh, and I mean, they know that I'm available every time uh, if they want something. Uh, but I would like to point out something in general. So really, uh, a lot of studies shows from SARS era that the EMS provider are exposed to depression and anxiety, PTSD and burnout during the pandemic. Uh, and I would like to um, just put some advice to uh, the staff out there uh, that there is a lot of factor contributing to this. I'm not gonna go through this, but how they can identify themselves, how they can, that they are in a stress, how, hard, how to protect themselves. If they think that when they are going out of the shift, they cannot rest, they cannot fall asleep, they're feeling tired. And um, they are like just having all this negative feeling, they're frustrated, they are fighting with their friends and colleagues, with their family, they are isolated. This is a sign of stress and they need to seek help. Seeking help by many ways. Either you identify this sign and symptom and you start talking to a friend and working on it, or usually the institutes have their own uh, phone number and lines. Uh, as I think one of the, like the military hospital in Jeddah, they have their own line for the provider. Um, actually, I'm not aware if our university have the same one, uh, but I mean, if somebody, if any one of our staff came and talked to us, we definitely, we have a lot of psychiatrists, we can find the, the like the right channel for them. Um, but like one of the things that to make them um, prevent going through that, and to be honest, me, myself, I'm doing these techniques. Uh, any bad experience you are facing or stressful, du stress during the shift, you need to ventilate out. So you either talk to friend or write it down in a notebook if you are not, if you don't like to talk. Uh, when you go home, avoid news, avoid like Twitter, social media, all the stuff talking about COVID, like COVID in the hospital, COVID in the ambulance, COVID everywhere. It's like just making you crazy. When you yeah. go home, try to have a quality time with your family, quality time for yourself. Watch movie, listen to music, do whatever. Just something make you relax away from the COVID stuff. Like really try to have a good sleep, try to reduce caffeine. I'm trying, but I'm like not successful till now, but at least six hours before the time of your sleep, try to decrease it so you will have a good sleeping time. And if you can do exercise, obviously with like all the gyms closed now, try to do like some yoga at home and uh, do breathing exercise. This is, these things are very helpful. I think if like staff try to do it at home, they will get benefit a lot. Um, yeah, and remember, Excellent. like, that's yeah. fantastic. Okay. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Victoria. Right. Go ahead. Yeah, just, just last thing. Like, yes. you guys, we cannot go through this unless we have, unless we have each other backs. So please, please do not hesitate to seek for help if you need it. And the only way to get through this time, the like the pandemic time, to be together and having each other back. So, yeah. That's yeah, I think I is. think this very important point. I noticed. Uh, many colleagues they are afraid to disclose that they are emotionally debriefed so i think uh, we we should encourage each other if i'm stressful if i'm depressed i think we should talk to each other and that will help us a lot that's great so last question for you dr Tihal, in in uh, like in one or two minute time is there any teaching opportunity during this covid 19 era i know it's we we are not supposed to teach it's a very risky but from this COVID uh, pandemic, is there any opportunity you can raise up so to teach ourselves? Yeah, so uh, we actually are doing online education. I mean, not for my EMS staff yet, but for we did it for the students. So we use the different uh, modality online, actually, which attract a large number. So we re you really can use like all the platform online, Zoom, 
uh, there is a lot of virtual simulation things. So initially we thought that, oh, we cannot teach any procedure. We cannot teach patient uh, communication for our student. But we found out that there is many uh, stuff online uh, teach you how to give virtual simulation, how to do scenarios actually that almost like a real life to your staff uh, by using like Kahoot, Zoom, uh, using there is a program full code. And even I found like in YouTube that if your institute will not pay for virtual simulation stuff that you can create, there is an institute have uh, a videos on how to create the 360 picture for scene. And then uh, you can incorporate the I simulate vital sign, put them together in a video and show it to your student. And then you have interaction with them through Zoom and see how they're going to do it. Uh, then when they come to the shift, so this is like my plan in the future. And then they can see it at home, do this stuff on Zoom. And when they come in the shifts, we can like apply it. Um, and really, I get used of a lot, a benefit of a lot of things online. There is a lot of academic institute uh, open their resources for free. Oxford Medical Simulation, UIC, uh, the National Association for EMS uh, Provider, Educator, and the uh, Society for uh, Simulation and Healthcare. These are really good resources. They have even like a links in it. And like, really, there is a lot of opportunity. You do not have to reinvent the wheel. Just use Excellent. what's there and add on it. And the sky is your limit. So really, you just need to be... Uh, active and proactive and try to do the stuff and it's really a good opportunity so it's excellent like, so i mean yeah, we're I, I, trying to do it hopefully it will work like i mean it works I, with our students so hopefully in the future it will i think this is the, the this is the future this is probably one of the uh, revolution points from this covid 19 is the online education and all the effort effort has been going on. One of them is our webinar, actually. So uh, thank you, thank you for these tips, uh, Dr. Abtihal. Uh, now, last but least is our um, friend and another another speaker who is joining us in this webinar, Dr. Hani Ibrahim. Dr. Hani Ibrahim is uh, a friend of mine. He's my like I will say elder brother. Uh, we worked together in that same hospital at King Saud University. Now he is uh, an emergency medicine consultant and the program director at HMG Rayyan Hospital, Al Habib Medical Group Rayyan Hospital uh, in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Now let's we moved from Europe to Saudi Red Crescent Authority to university. Now we'll go to the private sector. So, Dr. Hani. Uh, first question for you, mate. What is the rapid response team at HMG uh, in the in the social media in the news? Mashallah, barakallah. HMG is advertising for the rapid response team. Can you give us an idea about this rapid response team? Yeah, thank you, Aziz. Uh, first of all, I'd uh, like to thank you for this opportunity. Uh, um, it's a, uh, it's my honor to be here with all the experts in AMS. Um, before I start my talk, you know, just uh, I have one point, you know, you keep me uh, the last one, you know, so the other thing is um, one, one of the comments on um, Twitter, you know, one of the medics, uh, he was unhappy because we did not invite any uh, uh, paramedic in this webinar. Uh, I just, um, uh, today I just knew that uh, Dr. Ivis Hobo, he's, he was a medic, so I think he's representing, you know, the paramedics. Uh, Dr. Ahmed Khalisa is again, he's uh, representing the whole, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia Crescent, you know, not only the paramedics. So I think, um, I don't know, maybe next time you, can, you could invite, you know, our medics, our heroes, you know, uh, to talk about their, you know, and they are very important, you know, uh, in this you know, pandemic. So um, uh, to answer your question about the rapid response team at uh, HMG, so uh, uh, to understand, you know, the rapid response team, so we should understand the uh, the idea of the uh, tele emergency medicine center. So um, Al Habib um, um, group they started you know this um, uh, tele emergency medicine center a um, uh, few months ago. Um, uh, basically, that that center was founded a couple of years ago as a command center for the for the medics for the for the paramedics, and it controls the whole you know um, the hospitals here in Riyadh and also like outside Riyadh, like in Al Khuba. Recently, they opened one branch in the Eastern province in Khobar. So um, uh, this tele-emergency medicine center, basically it has um, uh, uh, medics, they are responding you know, to the calls. So they, they, they work as a, you know, uh, call takers and dispatcher. Uh, plus they do have a physician working with them. 
uh, emergency medicine, um, usually a certified physician, he's a, a, a specialist in emergency medicine. So they have the privilege of having, you know, a specialist uh, beside them, you know, answering some question. But basically they are the one who's taking the, you know, uh, the calls, you know, and whenever they are in need of the, of the, of the, uh, of the specialist, you know, he will be involved uh, with, with them. So uh, basically, they, uh, their job um, to answer, you know, uh, these emergency uh, medicine calls and to decide if they need to deploy to, to dispatch an ambulance to that uh, call. So uh, they categorize the patient based on the uh, whatever system we are using. The, the, I mean, the, like the Canadian system, uh, if it's something top emergency, if the patient, you know, is unstable, you know, they, they will ask, you know, the, um, the, the caller to contact, you know, Saudi Red Crescent because they are the one who should handle, you know, the, mm. the you know, the sick uh, patients, uh, basically. It doesn't mean they don't respond to sick patient, but basically the patient like in a top emergency or cardiac arrest. So they would give advice over the phone. So basically they do have a physician or the medics himself. He can give um, an advice, a piece of advice over the phone to start, you know, CPR and to do uh, whatever, you know, recommended and to call out the red crescent. And um, basically they do have uh, that physician uh, sometimes they can give that uh, advice of that simple case of that, that um, I mean, uh, case is a simple case, doesn't need um, an ambulance. They would advise the patient, you know, to seek, you know, uh, medical care next day, for example. If that's not uh, an emergency case. And they go through, you know, certain questions to decide, you know, uh, if that case, uh, you know, was top emergency or not. And they will um, definitely they will screen for the COVID-19 since we are dealing with this pandemic nowadays. Uh-huh. Excellent. Yeah. So, so that's telemedicine and rapid response. I think it's working well at HMG Group um, in, in in providing a healthcare services. Um, and and really, it's I've seen it. It's really good one. Uh, so, congratulations for having this. Now, Dr. Heine, um, give us your opinion about using portable isolator in in ambulance car for transferring positive COVID-19 patients. Um, so uh, it, does it really make big difference or uh, uh, is it just enough to protect ourselves, put a face mask on a patient and then transfer him? Yeah, I mean, the, the idea of this, the, the portable isolator or the incubator or whatever you call it, you know, came after the Ebola like five, seven, day, seven years ago. So um, uh, I think it's not something luxurious. Initially, you know, people, they thought, you know, this is a luxury, you know, kind of the transportation, you know. It's, um, it's um, basically, basically it's an, um, a nice, uh, you know, incubator for the patient. Uh, it's not all cases they go in this, uh, you know, incubator or this um, uh, portable isolator. You should select your patients. You select, you know, um, uh, who goes in this um, uh, device. Um, those patients with um, highly contagious, those patients with, uh, with lots of secretions, you know, uh, or those patients who they need to be transferred in the, let's say, flight medicine. You are going to transport one patient from one area to another area. And it's really, you know, exhausting for the, for the um, EMS crew to wear all these PBEs for a long time, for, for three, four hours. So it's better to put this patient in that, you know, uh, uh, portable isolator, you know, and then to transport him. Uh, it's good. It, it's going to prevent, you know, uh, contamination of the crew. Dr. Abtihal, uh, she mentioned that uh, uh, during that uh, transfer, you know, you should take care of the cabinet, you know, the driver cabinet, you know, the crew cabinet, uh, especially if there is like air circulating, you know. So you need to minimize, you know, any um, contamination to the to the place itself, to the uh, to the cabinet, to the compartment, also to the crew. So uh, those patients. Uh, highly contagious, you know, I think they are a good, you know, candidate for this kind of uh, uh, incubator. Can we put this patient and deal with him like any other patient? We can do suction, we can provide oxygen, uh, uh, connect him to the ECG, uh, electrodes, all this stuff. Yes, it has some openings, you know, at the side of that, you know, an incubator where you can, uh, you put your hands, you know, uh, as, as, as if you are wearing gloves inside this cabinet and you can um, uh, touch the patient and you can uh, do whatever you want. It has some openings at the side where you can uh, uh, supply the oxygen through the tubes or connecting mm-hmm. the electrodes. So I think it's, it's a good, uh, you know, um, uh, portable, uh, you know, machine and portable device 
for the transportation. It, uh, not all patients uh, should be transported. You should select your, uh, uh, you know, patient. And it's a good, you know, modality for the transporting, you know, highly contagious patients, especially in the in the area of, um, I mean, or of flight uh, uh, medicine. Excellent. So, so possibly it's a really good tool, but uh, I believe there is some limited use for it uh, with excellent precaution. So, um, Defin it's really yeah, definitely it, it has its um, limitation, you know, in the use, especially, you know, those patients, morbid obese patients, they, they might not fit inside, you know, uh, these uh, devices, you know, as very critical, yeah. unstable patients. I, I don't think so. They are a, a candidate yeah. for the transportation. Yeah. So, we should select yeah. certain, you know, patients. So, I mean, it's, yep. it's good um, idea, but not for all. Yeah, totally. Not for all. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. So going now uh, is is I think we, we highlighted about the HMG screening tools for suspected COVID nineteen patient. Maybe just we can give us some summary about it, Dr. Han. Uh, definitely, we uh, we use the you know our screening tool is the our you know tool recommended by the Ministry of Health. So uh, yep. we don't deviate from their recommendation. We uh, comply. We implement their recommendations. And plus, we have you know our clinical sense. That's why when I, um, I said that we got the privilege of having you know physician you know answering um, or you know beside the paramedic answering the calls, it it, it gives you the you know um, um, uh, the credit you know sometimes you need to dig more in detail in the history you know so you might elaborate more details by the physician sometimes it's going to be uh, beneficial you know of screening you know such patient but definitely we are uh, following uh, the recommendations from the um, uh, Minister of Health we we were working under their uh, umbrella. Excellent. So we all agreed now. So Saudi Red Crescent Authority, uh, University Hospital, and private hospital were using the same guideline. Our reference is is Saudi CDC. Wakaya is is our our way to go. Now, uh, suppose you you wanted to start a high flow oxygen, Dr. Hani, for the patient inside the ambulance for any reason. So what are the guidelines? What are the changes that you guys implemented? Uh, for this uh, procedure, I think Dr. Abdihal she mentioned um, the, uh, something regarding you know starting high nasal um, uh, high flow and, and oxygen by nasal cannula, which is that uh, if you if you need to use it, uh, you use it you know, but you need to cover the patient. You need to put, it, to put um, the face mask on the top of that nasal cannula to decrease you know the, the uh, aerosol generating you know procedure. We know this is one of the, um, uh, maybe it's not the uh, highest, you know, aerosol generating procedure um, in the airway management, maybe the intubation, the bag valve mass, it's, uh, bagging, I mean, I mean, it's uh, generating more, you know, aerosol, but still the high uh, flow nasal cannula might generate more, um, you know, uh, aerosol. So uh, just to minimize this, you should put the uh, face mask oxygen on top of that. Uh, having said that, uh, the first of all, you should decide when to use it. I mean. Uh, maybe we have, you know, people that are talking about, you know, uh, happy hypoxic patients. So uh, if, if your patient, I mean, hemodynamically is stable and you are maintaining good oxygenation by the face mask, by simple mask, no need to go for these, you know, modalities. No need to go for, you know, putting the oral airways, bagging the patient, uh, giving him high nasal uh, flow oxygen or to go for the, you know, like, uh, unnecessary intubation. So I think... Um, uh, it's it's um, um, uh, selected, you know, uh, it's case by case. So the, the medics, the physician, they should decide when to go for this, you know, procedure. I know it's the least, you know, aerosol generating a, a, a procedure, but again, we should, uh, you know, protect ourselves. We should protect, you know, the environment, you know, we should not disseminate, yep. you know, these, you know, uh, viruses here and there. I agree. So the oxygen, what I mean by high flow oxygen is probably something above five or six liter is, yes. is, is a high flow oxygen. So even just putting a simple face mask with six liter on, that's concerned as aerolyzing, generalizing procedure. So we have to be very careful with, with, with that. Um, uh, can I have a BiPAP or CPAP pre-hospital? I think that's more dangerous also. So we have to be very cautious and totally. select our patient. Totally, Excellent. Totally now, uh, now, moving now to the last question, Dr. Hani, is intubation at the pre-hospital, COVID patients. Do we do that? Is it good for them or is it bad? Uh, uh, so I think the question, uh, I would ask the same question, do we do intubation in emergency for COVID-19? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think uh, it's, again, it's case by case. I can't say that we should or we should not intubate patients. Uh, you should select your um, uh, patient very carefully. 
again, you know, um, the, all the expert speakers, they emphasize on um, uh, our safety, our paramedic safety, you know, uh, and I think this is very important, you know, step um, in the management in the, uh, of those patients in the pre-hospital setting. So um, um, I would I would suggest that you know it's um, it's very difficult, very hard to have a clear you know uh, guideline for uh, when to intubate, when not to intubate. Uh, but I think it's um, uh, it's very uh, uh, I would say uh, a high risk erosion generating a procedure. So uh, you are um, uh, keeping or you are uh, you know uh, endangering your you know crew, the staff, you know, for this um, uh, viruses, you know. If that you know airway cannot be managed by the high flow oxygen, as we mentioned earlier, if we just giving a simple face mask or just adding adding the nasal cannula at high flow rate, um, I mean, no need to go for bag uh, valve mask, no need to go for you know uh, non invasive you know if you need if you are forced you know um, to manage the airway. I mean, the, the tube is the only way to go. I should do it you know as Dr. Um, uh, Tia said, you should you know do it. You should uh, pull over, you should open the, the door, you know, take full precautions, you know, uh, uh, using, you know, N95, if, if you have the um, eye shield or your goggle, you know, or if you have the, the, the proper, go, go for that, you know. Uh, uh, and exactly. use, if you have a disposable, you know, uh, equipment, if you have the laryngoscope, the disposable one, you should use that one. And you should do it, um, I mean, from the first attempt, you know, and the most expert person, you should do it from the first attempt, you know, we should succeed in that airway from the first attempt, or I think it's going to be a mess, it's going to be a very risky procedure in the, in the pre-hospital setting. So uh, the same thing happened, you know, inside the emergency, we minimized, you know, the, the number of, you know, people, you know, around doing the procedure, uh, minimize the equipment, uh, no need to uh, go for a bag valve mask, you know, uh, and if you are pushed to do it, you know, for, for that sick patient, do it uh, with a disposable, you know, um, uh, I mean, equipment, take full precautions, uh, wear your full PPE, the paper is the way to go, go for it. And um, uh, nowadays, uh, I think most of the hospitals, they do have, um, uh, as Dr. Tehashi mentioned that the plastic cover, you know, the, the plastic or nylon or whatever, some of the hospitals, they do have this rigid plastic box, you know, uh, I tried one time, yeah. I tried to play with the airway, it's, it's very, very difficult. It's not an easy, you know, yeah. uh, um, so I think yeah. um, take full precautions, you know, before going uh, with that, you know, and good luck with that, you know, because it's going to be a, I, I get, it's really a tricky procedure. And I believe probably if I can do maximize non-invasive ventilation, like for example, just, just a high flow oxygenation and just transfer this patient immediately to the hospital, that will be better. Unless if I'm really eager to intubate this patient, it will be really tricky. And as I said, good luck. Uh, it's really time consuming. So probably the time I can use it to transfer the patient. Um, good. So by this, I will, I will conclude my, my, my question for our beloved four speakers. It was really good. One and a half hour of discussion. Now I will try to check the questions uh, here uh, if it is possible. And uh, let's get some some something to answer uh, and maybe direct some. Uh, I have here uh, possibly received this question is what do you wear if no respiratory symptoms? So I believe if I'm right, uh, if, if you have a patient, you went for a call uh, and the patient doesn't have a respiratory symptoms, so what precaution uh, do you wear? I, I will put this question to Dr. Evis, uh, if you can answer that. Yes, thank you, Aziz, for that question. Uh, actually, it's, uh, my answer is very simple. Uh, do yeah. the same as it, it would have respiratory symptoms. We yeah. know that COVID-19 can have other presentations other than respiratory, like, for example, diarrhea or gastrointestinal symptoms. So. As uh, Dr. Heptihal also pointed out and Dr. Hani, we should think about the safety of our EMTs and our paramedics and our doctors and nurses first. So for me, it's very similar. COVID suspected with non-respiratory symptoms, same procedures, same, same safety procedures. That's my I agree. Answer. I think I think. Yeah, I think I agree with that completely. Now, um, uh, I, will, I will. There is another question here. 
uh, how do we decontaminate the ambulance and what equipment is required? Um, I don't, Dr. Ahmed, can you help us with this question? Uh, what equipment is required to decontaminate the ambulance? Okay. Um, in our institution, actually, uh, we use uh, so the, uh, specific, uh, specialized uh, uh, machine uh, with the hydrogen, hydrogen peroxide uh, solution, uh, specifically for uh, uh, it's used after high suspicion ca uh, transferred case uh, uh -huh. uh, in between patient to patient. Actually, we uh, using a surface uh, spray disinfectant uh, to uh, disinfectant uh, the surface uh, has been used by the patient during the transfer. Mm -hmm. That's uh, what we did. Uh, actually, we have a, a designated area for uh, disinfection, uh, disinfecting uh, uh, the ambulance. Uh, all over uh, the regions, uh, and accordingly, uh, we, we go for uh, uh, either uh, to uh, do a, uh, a regular disinfecting between patient to patient, or uh, doing the uh, 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 let's say intensive disinfecting by using uh, the, uh, the specialized machine. What uh, I mentioned before. Excellent. Now, so there is another question, probably I would uh, give it to Dr. Abtihal, is would you recommend a closed technique for chest tube insertion? So... Um, um, I mean, I don't know what he, like, yeah. what he mean by closed technique, but in either way, um, so you need to clamp the chest tube before you put it on. Because we usually, what we used to, like to put the chest tube and the other end is open. And you need to connect it to all the drainage before you take the clamp out. Uh, and uh, as we said, uh, connect it to the suction with a viral filter. Uh, I mean, it's considered, maybe it's considered close technique because you're not going to have the gush of air or the blood right away until you take the clamp out. So maybe that's what mm -hmm. he meant with the close technique. So I'll possible, I uh, yeah. I'm hoping so because it wasn't clear, but I believe he was pointing to the clamping thing. Mm -hmm. uh, now, um, Dr. Hani, I will give you this question. Uh, how can we protect ourselves and others if we don't know that this patient is a positive? Um, as Dr. Ibis, he said that we should deal with all patients as the, they are COVID-19 until proven otherwise. So uh, exactly. it doesn't mean that we are, should wear all the N95 all, all, the, all the time. But, you know, again, we are following the recommendation of the infection control um, in the hospital or from the Minister of Health. You know, sometimes you get the recommendation to keep the mask on all the time. So uh, uh, this is one thing. The other thing, you know, try your best to minimize the contact with the patients, you know, unnecessary contact with the patients and minimize the number of, of, of physician or, you know, healthcare providers um, contact with the, with the same patients, you know. So um, uh, initially, I think one of the questions was to the doctor, maybe Tihal for the teaching. Are we, do, are we doing more teaching or do any kind of teaching in the COVID-19? I think they are, we teach um, our resident um, not to go uh, in group to see a patient, you know. We should limit, you know, the number of uh, physicians, number of residents, you know, seeing the patient. All health care providers should take precautions. We should minimize the number, taking the, um, in the, the simple, you know, the PPA precautions, uh, wearing the uh, simple face mask, um, uh, uh, I mean, the gloves, I think it would be so... Uh, recommendations or it would be enough recommendations. Uh, I got here a very nice question. If a patient needs suctioning, shouldn't he get intubated? Suctioning and intubation risk aren't they the same? Uh, Dr. Reeves, can you give us some point about this one? Oh, uh, that's a good one and a tricky one. Uh, yeah. I what we saw with the most serious uh, patients uh, in the past weeks that uh, if you get intubated, and I think it's an international phenomenon, people stay three, four, five, six weeks on the ventilator. And we heard about high flow and non-invasive, etc. If you can keep the patient off the ventilator, please do it. Uh, because it's, it's not a good sign to get on the ventilator. 
but this makes it difficult. Okay, suctioning without a ventilator. Okay, you know it's not it's not very comfortable, etc. But you should do it, and um, it's it's looking case by case. I have no clear cut answer on that, and you should exactly. I think in 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 respect of the patient situation. If he needs intubated for oxygenation reasons, no discussion. And then you can suction, mm -hmm. it's no problem. Uh, you know, we all know that suctioning a, a non-intubated patient is very is very difficult and also a risk in in aerolizing. Uh, it's an, a high high risk activity, but it depends on the situation of the patient. Just be in mind that getting a patient on the ventilator, if you can avoid it, Excellent. that's my answer. Yeah. That's fantastic. Uh, I will take the last question here, which is uh, uh, probably I'll give it to Dr. Hani. Is there a specific way to cover the patient during ventilation? Um, during you mean uh, ventilation? You mean uh, uh, mechanical ventilation or or? Uh, let's 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 take the whole thing. Uh, let's take the whole thing. Okay, Meca mechanical ventilation, non-invasive during the intubation, or maybe just as Dr. Ertihal said, during the CPR, for example. Yeah, I, I think the best way, you know, to use this, um, the, any kind of cover, but, you know, definitely the, the transparent, you know, cover, like a nylon cover would be good, you know. There is one of the tricks, you know, uh, you get the nylon cover, you know, and you hook it up from, uh, just attach it to the lamp or just one of the, you know, uh, thing up, you know, just make like um, an umbrella. So uh, uh, that would be a good idea, you know. So uh, if you, I, I don't know, I had a bad experience with this uh, box, you know, I, it was not a good experience for me, but, um, I think the, the the nylon one or the any cover, you know, would, would be a good idea. Uh, I don't know, but the others, do they have any experience with the with the, with, the, with that rigid, you know, box? You know, it was not a good experience for me. Uh, I don't know, uh, Dr. Abtihal, did you have any experience? No, or? but I mean, I saw the picture, and I don't think you yeah. will like really have the movement to can so you can yeah. do the intubation and all this stuff. Uh, I mean. Uh, it will be yeah, I, think, I I read a blog about about this uh, this box in in um, life in the fast lane probably or uh, the yeah. first uh, 10 a.m. One of these blogs. Uh, there is a study came up from a lab. It shows it's kind of uh, do not prevent the uh, aerolizing procedure. It do not prevent the, the the droplets to the intubator. And it's as you said, it's difficult to uh, to to move your hand. Plus, I believe maybe Ahmed will agree with me, is it's difficult to put that box inside the ambulance car and try to, with the moving ambulance, try to do something inside. So I think, I think that box is taking uh, uh, lots of advertisement through the social media. Uh, and definitely we need lots of study about it. Um, okay, uh, so at the end, I know it's really lovely time with all of you guys. I really thank you from my heart. Uh, for joining me in this webinar, in this fantastic discussion. I can go all the way through the night, but I know we have to stop. Uh, we already exceeded the time, uh, but it's really thank you for this lovely night. Thank you for this discussion. I learned a lot from you guys from Belgium, from Saudi Red Crescent, from the private and from the university, uh, the other colleague university, yeah? <laughs> the best university in Saudi Arabia so far. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, and it's really, uh, we're looking forward to meet you again, either once after the COVID era, maybe live face to face or again through the webinar. So thank you so much uh, for everyone. Thank you, Sassi. Thank, 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 thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for all. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for giving us a chance to be with them. Sassi Medical Education, all the best. Kul aam antum bkhair wa eidun barak, inshallah. 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 Thank you, Aziz, for the uh, for having me invited. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you, Abel Rahmani. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.